the Galapagos, one of the strangest corners of the planet. These islands hold the key to a great mystery, clues to the origin of life itself. On a mission to seek out the unique and the bizarre, fearless actor Richard Dreyfuss turns intrepid explorer. It's like I've landed on the moon. Black lava, as far as the eye can see. Miles and miles of black lava. Looks like someone was surfacing the highway and overordered. <laughs> if the place looks strange, the characters here are even stranger. It's funny that we made one of the great monsters of the 20th century to look like him. You know, the beast that ain't Tokyo. But the real question is, how do these extraordinary creatures come to look and act as they do? See that? And why do they only live here on these islands? On the Galapagos, Richard Dreyfus discovers the answers. Answers that can be found in the wild. Funding for In the Wild is provided by annual financial support from viewers like you. Quito, the capital of Ecuador, high in the Andes of South America. The starting point for my journey into the wild. I'm off to a land of strange creatures. Creatures that are found nowhere else on Earth. I've heard stories about the Galapagos Islands that are full of mystery, myth, even murder. Islands which inspired ideas about the origin of life itself. Ideas which were described as being like confessing to a murder. At least there's nothing strange about the animals in the local market. Almost everything here will finish up in the pot. Even the guinea pigs, I'm afraid. Well, I can handle that. Distinct. Whoa! Whoa! Every match, every match, every match. No, Peter, no, they can't be demand on them. Call my lawyer. Thank goodness I had my tetanus shot. This is gonna keep bleeding. It's not the guinea pig's teeth that worries me, it's the bandage. My first injury on this film, but probably not my last. <laughs> I think you need some... So we don't have to like... <coughs> okay. No. Uh, this is probably going to uh, bode rather ill for the whole show, but... Maybe not. Maybe we'll look back on this as the really the worst time. I doubt it. What is it that's so relaxing about a long sea voyage? Is it the fact that unless the cook goes mad, there's zero chance of getting bitten by something? The Galapagos are a little group of 16 islands, 600 miles out in the ocean off the coast of Ecuador. They weren't even found until the 16th century because they're so remote. This is, after all, the Pacific Ocean. Huge, frightening, and, well, endless. The rest of the crew has seen it all before, but when you're a city boy like me, things like this you can just watch forever. I'm wondering how long a Los Angelino like me could survive if I ever got stranded. I'm also wondering whether or not the name of this show will be Richard Dreyfus in the Galapagos Islands or Out of Character. We'll see. For centuries, the Galapagos Islands were visited by nobody but pirates, buccaneers, and whalers. Then came explorers, map makers, naturalists, the most famous of these being Charles Darwin, who came here in 1835.
When Darwin rode ashore, like me, he had no idea that he would discover something here that would change the way we view our world. lava as far as the eye can see. Miles and miles of black lava. Looks like someone was surfacing the highway and over-ordered. Nothing. Well, I've been through this whole lava bed from stem to stern, and there's no life. <sighs> it's empty, except for a lone cactus, which actually seems to be doing okay, in spite of the lack of water. It's a type of cactus which grows on lava, and it's called the lava cactus. I like that. The Galapagos are in fact the tops of huge volcanoes which rose out of the ocean four million years ago. The western islands still erupt today, with red hot lava meeting cold seawater and petrifying into rock. So when the Galapagos were formed, there was no life on them whatsoever. For the past few million years, Animals and plants have reached the islands by swimming or flying or being carried in the wind. But what could possibly have prepared those first castaways? Coming from the luscious mainland to this barren desert must have been like traveling back to the beginning of time. Only the weirdest sort of creatures could possibly make a go of it. anything can look the part here, this is it. It looks like a dinosaur that's been in the bath too long, gray and shrunken. The marine iguana, the only seagoing lizard in the world. With a worn out comb along its back, it's like a stegosaurus in a secondhand coat. Not just surviving either, thriving. With the big males fighting for territory along the shoreline, and fighting for the right to mate with the females on the slopes above. Where did these hideous creatures come from? There is no such thing as the marine iguana or the remains of one anywhere else in the world. Anywhere. And remember, the Galapagos were empty. So, did they come from another planet? These are the only iguanas in the world that feed in the sea. But right now, they're warming themselves up in the sun before they take another swim. The animals here are pretty much unconcerned with predators. There's nothing much in the Galapagos that would frighten an iguana. Until I came along. Can I get any closer? I'm asking you. You're my acting partner. Do you know a guinea pig in Quito? It's funny that we made one of the great monsters of the 20th century to look like him. Beast that ain't Tokyo. Hey. 
You know that thing you do with the salt water? Don't do it. I'm not afraid of you. I'm just disgusted. What is the iguana's point of view? What are they thinking? I can imagine that this is in some way some very lazy, humid version of hell where everyone is always saying, whoops, sorry, whoops, my fault, sorry, whoops, sorry, whoops, me fault, whoops, sorry. Or that it's an iguana schwitzba in Miami Beach and all these 60-year-old guys are sitting around belching and waiting for their wives to come out of the manicure. They got it sewn up here, these iguanas. They fit this place. So, were they made to order? I mean, are these designer reptiles? Tough, ugly creatures made for a tough, ugly landscape? Or did they just uh, spring from the lava one day fully equipped? Until Darwin, that's what people used to think, that all animals appeared on Earth as finished products, fully assembled and ready to go. It's like the story of the watch. If you found a watch on the ground, where would you think it had come from? You'd assume, wouldn't you, that this amazingly intricate machine hadn't grown out of the ground. It must have been designed and carefully assembled by, by someone, a watchmaker, presumably. Well, any living being is far more complicated than a watch. Was the marine iguana specially created for the Galapagos? We know that other reptiles made it across from the mainland. The problem is, the marine iguana has never existed on the mainland or anywhere else in the world. So the million dollar question for me was, where did the marine iguana come from? Where do new species come from? Darwin called this the mystery of mysteries. The answer that he proposed the theory of evolution is as controversial today as it was a hundred years ago. The problem is that, like all theories, evolution is invisible. But if it's possible to find any clues, this is the place to do it, the Galapagos. A few miles from the black lava, I was on a sandy beach overrun with sea lions. Looked like I missed one hell of a party. Everyone was still sleeping it off, eyes closed tight against the mid-morning sun. I felt like I was the cleaning lady and everybody had forgotten I was coming. This is the end of their breeding season and the place is full of pups of all sizes. This one is only a few weeks old. Doesn't it help when animals are mammals? It's as if we're naturally attracted to our own kind. I mean, I, 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 don't get me wrong, I adore reptiles, I really, I really do. But we're all programmed to respond to big brown eyes and that help you, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you, you, heard the expression, coochie, coochie, coo? It goes, coochie, coochie, coo? This really was more like it. Relaxing on the beach with some fellow mammals. Had I but known it, I was more in danger at this moment than at any time before. Because this is him, the boss, the beach master, the chief male, and this is my guide with some sobering advice. This is the most dangerous animal in the Galapagos. It's more dangerous than, than sharks. If you get into his territory, he will come and attack you and bite you. And look at him, there he is right there, barking at us. That's where they mate, in the water. They copulate in the water and that's why they're so dangerous in shallow water. 
And if you were to walk in there right now, he would come charging towards you, and you'd risk getting bitten. And, um, and if, I, if I was standing here and I was near a female, what would happen? If you were near a female, he would be... He, if that female was in heat, you would be in a lot of trouble because he wants to mate with that female and he feels like you're coming in to take, to take his female away from him. So uh, he would come charging at you to try to force you out of his territory. And if you were being charged by a, by a beach master, what, would, what are your options? Your options are really to run like hell. <laughs> These adolescents may look evenly matched, but some will grow up to be Charles Atlas and others are destined to have sand flippered in their faces. They'll struggle and compete until one is proved to be the strongest and will get a shot at becoming the beach master. These are all natural surfers. I'm trying to sing here. Frankie, get back in. Get in it and go on in there. Sea lions seem to come to life in the water. After all, these, these are originally from California. That's true, they really are. That's why they like to surf. This spectacular display was more than just fun. It made me realize just how complex and varied life can be. I'm trying to work out the science of the Galapagos to understand evolution. But right now, all I can see is a miracle. See that? This is dawn in the Galapagos. I haven't been up this early since... Well, since the last time I was up this late. The good ship Alta is anchored off one of the three islands in the Galapagos that has human inhabitants. They say I've got to have my wits about me when I meet Gus Engermeyer. He's an 85-year-old German the self-styled King of the Galapagos. Nobody knows the islands like Gus Engermeyer. He's not just a king. He's a philosopher, a naturalist, a guru. Oh, and I've been warned to brush up on my Shakespeare. Who's there? A subject of His Majesty. Excuse One of your subjects, Your Majesty. This above all, <laughs> to let old self be true, and it must follow as night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Who are you? Don't Hamlet. get scared. Huh? Oh, Hamlet! <laughs> Come on, Hamlet. Oh. <laughs> yeah, relax, relax. <laughs> yes, ma. Let me get a little more light. Huh? What is that? A, a whale, yes. It's Philip. You see the backbone, only the ribs are missing in front. You see? A huge whale backbone dominated the entire cave, like a great wave frozen above us. And all around us was a vast collection of wildlife remains. <laughs> have you seen the life whale? I have seen it. With that. its tremendous fluke, that's where the power is on it. 
This stuff was found washed up on beaches all over the Galapagos. Goose was very keen to show me a message, not in a bottle, but on a whale's jawbone. He had inscribed on it a quote from Einstein. The most extraordinary is the universe has a feeling. Albert Einstein. The universe has a feeling. Yes. Do you grasp, my friend, what that means? No. Stupidity. <laughs> If I could grasp Albert Einstein, I'd be a richer man than I am. <laughs> I should not. Do you feel that? To see, open thine eyes. Just look around. Wherever you go in this life, wherever and whatever you see, you have your own feeling, and and feeling is you have your own opinion. I think I know what Goose was telling me. I had to work it out for myself. To do that, I had to be more than just an observer. I had to get involved. Everything here depends on the richness of the sea. It was time to get my feet wet and make my first dive in 20 years. I've, uh, I've done this a couple of times in Hawaii, but not in this area. And uh, we're looking for sea lions to play with. And going underwater is when I, when I get used to it, I, I feel serene and excited and happy. There's a, a point, however, right before that where I feel panicked and terrified and weird. Let's go. There's that initial panic. I keep expecting a huge white shark to appear from nowhere. But the dark shape that looms towards me is a sea lion. For all its layers of blubber, it moves like a ballerina, and I feel like a gorilla in a tutu. My reaction to this is to think it's not just play, it's kind of putting me in my place for being slow and clumsy. Even though we're on the equator, the water is freezing cold. I'm not wearing this wetsuit for decency's sake, I need it. The cold water brings nutrients from the bottom of the sea. The whole food chain is driven by that fact. Tiny organisms feed on the minerals in the water, as do the plants, and the larger organisms upon them. Fish upon them, sea lions upon them. Turtles eat marine plants. They don't compete with the sea lions. But who'd be a fish with swimmers like this around? The only thing the sea lions have to watch out for is the same thing I have to, shark. I'm out of here. Funny, I can't wait to get myself out of the water, and then I can't wait to get some of it into me. I've seen reptiles and sea mammals that can survive almost anywhere along the shorelines of the Galapagos, 
but there are some places even they can't reach. This is the bird's domain. The sheer-sided rocks of some islands are accessible only by air, but the high cliffs and strong winds make perfect conditions for long-winged birds like the waved albatross. An eight-foot wingspan like this needs plenty of lift to take off, and the island of Española has become its private airport. Virtually all of the 12,000 pairs of waved albatrosses in the world come here to mate. And they get so involved in their elaborate smooching they don't even notice you're there. It's amazing. <laughs> um, what is that? I, I don't know. The clicks, the hoots, the funny walks seem to be a part of a process of pair bonding. But this incredible ritual, which must be one of the most elaborate and complicated dances in the world, remains a mystery to science. We can only guess what it all means. There's a repetition of behavior that really uh, allows you to think that you can begin to understand what they're doing. And I, I can't. I'm just fascinated by the fact that... I am fascinated by the fact the fact of this ritual. And see that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Turns out albatrosses can live for up to 60 years and they pair for life. So it makes sense that they get to know each other. In a few days' time, the last of the albatrosses will abandon their breeding ground, returning next season to continue their romance. More romance is going on within the quiet lagoons of the Galapagos, and from what I've heard, with as much passion. We've come here to look for green turtles mating. And all manner of marine life, like these golden rays, seem to be congregating in the lagoon for the big moment. Just like the albatrosses, the turtles cross thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean every year to return to the very spot where they themselves were conceived. This is one of the few places in the world that you can sit and watch the watery love affair unfold. No one knows why they make this pilgrimage, or how they find their way back here. It's as if they've been driven by an enormous compulsion, just as we are. We don't talk about it in the same way. We don't admit it in the same way. Everything seems to build to this moment. All of the incredible variety of, of life that exists here in the Galapagos all share one thing in common, this compulsion to procreate. All of the nesting, all of the activity, all of the waiting and the patience all lead to this. It's the most important thing in the world. It drives all of the animals. It drives us. We do not have sex because of ideology or nationalism or religion. Those are the institutions we use to try to keep us from having sex. But the compulsion to procreate is larger than any of our ideologies. It is, it is comparable to the urge that leads a turtle to cross the Pacific Ocean and find this one spot and mate 
during this one small window of opportunity that it has. It's the Galapagos equivalent of rush hour, the only road on Santa Cruz Island. We're off to the highlands to look for Galapagos, which is Spanish for giant tortoises. The highlands are one of the few places that get any rainfall. Suddenly, it's green. My guide is Fabio, an Ecuadorian naturalist with an English accent that would cut glass. He thinks he's heard the sound of tortoises mating. We can easily disturb them. I know that I wouldn't want to be interrupted if I were mating. Very careful with the noises you make. Getting closer. Mm. Very small female. We were almost there when the noises seemed to stop. Come closer. Come on, we can go all the way there. Do it. We had heard the sounds of two tortoises in the midst of sexual intercourse and we came through the forest uh, to try to watch them, but they either heard us or they finished. And uh, I think the evidence is that they finished because there are some cigarette butts right around here. Well, I really oh, I want you to know that this has been really great, but I have to go home and floss now. <laughs> so, if you don't mind. For most of the year, the giant tortoise is a solitary animal. It roams the volcanic highlands like a peaceful tank looking for a parking space. We're fairly sure that giant tortoises could have arrived in the Galapagos from Panama, where they're now extinct, floating on vegetation. If ever a creature was designed to patiently survive a long, dull sea voyage, this surely is it. Nobody knows exactly how long they live. They've outlived everyone who's tried to study them. There's a story of a Madagascan tortoise given to the King of Tonga in 1782 that was still alive in 1927. It was probably around 200 when it died. 200 years of doing practically nothing. And I don't know whether or not this is the life of some kind of quietly desperate prisoner or the final achieved state of a Buddha-like personality. I don't know if these tortoises are in this pond right now, out of their minds with boredom, or whether they're humming happily. It's up for grabs, I guess. Coming back out of the forest, 
Fabio thought he heard that noise again. Just make out two shapes stacked on top of each other in the undergrowth. Tortoises are not sexually mature until they're 50. But that could still mean a sex life of over a hundred years. It's worth waiting for, I guess. I feel exactly like David Attenborough. Well, not exactly. He would be doing this in shorts. I can never wear shorts. Is it my imagination or is there a lot of sex going on in these islands? All around me there seems to be this insatiable desire to breed. Those that don't make these extraordinary efforts, that don't swim across an ocean or lumber across a volcano or put their all into a courtship dance, don't get to mate and continue their line. Those that do make the effort have big families born with the same desires. Soon the population is dominated by avid breeders. But they have to stay alive long enough to find that mate, and the struggle begins right from birth, as I discovered when I visited a colony of masked booby birds. A sort of wildlife maternity ward. But in this cozy nursery, pretty soon a ghastly struggle starts to take place. The masked booby lays two eggs, five days apart. But the second egg is just the insurance, in case the first one doesn't hatch. The mother doesn't have enough resources to bring up both chicks. So instinctively, the older, stronger chick pushes the weaker one out of the nest. The parent seems unbothered by the whole thing as if it's all completely natural, which it is. She too was once a murderous chick. It's part of the blueprint which she inherited from her parents and which she now passes down to the next generation. There is no room for compassion. I guess this illustrates the phrase we've all heard so much, the survival of the fittest. The idea that it all comes down to the, the most strenuous, urgent, absolute rule that survival must happen and we will do anything to survive. What might seem to us like cold-blooded murder is in fact crucial to the survival of the masked booby. There is only enough space and food here for a limited number of individuals. The chick with the killer instinct wins out. This is the absolute rule by which the masked booby lives and it works. The proof lies in the fact that there are still such things as masked boobies. Now the expected reaction to all this might be shock or surprise, but we shouldn't be. 
we all live by that same rule, which should make this behavior, however cruel it appears, terribly familiar to us all. Survival is the great inheritance. But how does this process lead to the birth of a new species like the marine iguana? I still had a lot to discover. We're sailing around the northern tip of Isabella Island, toward the western side of the Galapagos, into the old hunting grounds of the whalers. Whales were plentiful here in 1800. By 1850, they've practically been wiped out. Now people come only to watch. There. There it is. It's a sperm whale breaching the surface and then disappearing as quickly as it came. Sometimes we'll see an animal uh, who seems to be precarious somehow, to have evolved uh, as if they were fitting a bad suit of clothes, you know, they have a, a foothold here and a toehold there and they're grasping with their tongue out here and they've got sweat all over their brow and they're just desperately trying to hold on to life. Not so with the whale. The whale seems perfect. The whale seems just what the whale should be. The whale has been evolving for around 60 million years. It's so perfectly adapted to the sea that it's impossible to work out how it ever learned to swim in the first place. The pelican is the same, a perfect flyer. But I was looking for imperfection, and I found it here on Fernandina Island. The flightless cormorant. As its name suggests, it's a bird that can't fly. The first imperfection I noticed was typically human. This male has just gone out to bring back something nice for the nest. And is there a thank you? I don't know. Not enough. I've done that. Because now he's going to dry off and go right back out again. Get an ulcer. Work too hard. Probably die younger. My sympathy is with you, pal. And don't come back until you've brought me a nice piece of seaweed. Watching him schlep back to the water's edge, I could see that here is an animal grasping onto life with an ill-fitting suit of clothes. This awkward bird is making its first evolutionary steps back to the sea. This is the only species of cormorant in the world that has given up its pilot's license for a more watery existence. In the Galapagos, where there's nothing to fly away from but plenty to dive for, this new design just seems to work better. The sea lion went back to the sea around 30 million years ago. This cormorant's only been diving for a couple of million years. It's not yet perfect, so it's easier to see how the changes are taking how it's adapting to its new environment. Large feet for paddling faster, smaller wings, which may one day disappear altogether, a larger body, which can hold more air and use less energy. What I see sitting here is the kind of uh, railroad station on the way from one point to another in the evolution of species. This, millions of years ago, was a cormorant that flew all over these islands. And millions of years from now, at the end of this journey, or at some further station down the road, it'll be perhaps a penguin. But right now, I can sit here and see it caught, in a sense, in mid-flight. It is on its way both to becoming something and having been something else. Of all the, the animals that I've seen here, it is the clearest indication that this 
process known as evolution is in fact happening right in front of us. And today it's happening right in front of me. It's a long process, and the cormorant is just taking it one step at a time. Evolution is a long, arduous journey made up of a series of small steps. Millions and millions of tiny, imperceptible progressions working through the changing environment. And it's only when you get to the end of that journey that you can look back and see how far you've come. On top of the cliff were some birds of a beautiful but wacky species who showed how this process can take off in any direction and produce the most extraordinary results. These are frigate birds. For some reason the females are attracted to red. So the males have developed this extraordinary technique for courtship to attract a mate. If there were other frigates that could do this, you'd want to be able to do this. The red pouch is attracting the females who are flying overhead. Females choose the males with the biggest, reddest pouches. Together, they will produce big, red, pouchy offspring. Why red? Why not? What matters to the male bird is that the female seems to like it. It all probably started off as a mistake. A frigate bird that was meant to be born all black, but because of a copying error in the genes, it had a red pouch. It begins by chance. Ah, heads. Two. Heads, and only three. Animals don't choose the way they evolve. Every generation throws up variations, and some of them work. Heads. Five. Heads, six. It might seem like a long shot, but then you might say the chances of a coin coming up heads a hundred times in a row is too tiny to consider. Heads. But what if you had thousands of years? Heads. It would be bound to happen sooner or later. Anything can happen. Yes! 100. After all, the world is over 4 billion years old. And when it does, it gets selected. Selection makes sense out of chance. It builds structure, it pushes evolution forward. Selection of a mate and selection of the most suitable. So, given enough time, maybe even something as incredible as a wing could evolve from the front limb of a reptile. Evolution is like a tree whose roots reach back to the beginning of time Chance throws out the buds, and selection has pruned the most suitable, helped them to grow, branching in different directions to fill every niche of land, sea, and air. The animals we see today are the tips of the tree, the winning branches. Now I think I can see the process more clearly. Competition and variation, chance and selection, can eventually lead one animal to turn into another. So finally, how do we explain the mysterious appearance in the Galapagos of the marine iguana? It was time to visit some old friends. Our first meeting hadn't been that successful, so I decided to try a new approach. My car broke down about a half hour out of town. 
I only have a driver's license and a master charge. Can you help me? So there were these three iguanas. Catholic, a Protestant, and a Jew. But I'm fine. I've worked some tough crowds, but this is ridiculous. Just say whatever comes into your mind. You in the balcony. It's like talking to a stone wall. Where did the marine iguana come from? Well, this could be it. There is a species of yellow land iguana living in the islands that did come originally from the mainland. It lives there still. So, imagine, if you will, once upon a time, a South American land iguana established itself on the Galapagos. Life was hard. It fought for food in this desperately barren landscape. And the best chance it had for survival was to feed on the great quantities of seaweed beneath the surface of the water. An iguana that happened to be good at doing this did well. It got plenty to eat. It grew strong. It won several mates. And it had many offspring. Its talent was passed down to the next generation. Some of those were stronger swimmers, perhaps or had larger claws to hang on to the rocks in the surf. But they survived. They reproduced. And soon, on the whole, there were more of them. The best suited won the chance to pass on their lucky genes. The losers were swept away by the tide. Thousands upon thousands of generations of blind tweaks and adjustments, et voila, the marine iguana. So they all lived happily ever after, and now marine iguanas far outnumber the land iguana in the Galapagos. Of course, it's, uh, it's just a tale, but at least it's possible to see how the marine iguana may have evolved. My three weeks in the Galapagos have been a revelation. And I've even found out something about myself. Well, I learned a little bit about rowing. Um, I found that there was really a kind of reward in waiting. And I found, I found it very peaceful. And the fact that I live in a kind of hullabaloo constantly made me doubt whether or not I could be patient. But waiting for the seals and the turtles and the tortoises and the frigate birds and the albatrosses to find each other was very rewarding. It made me begin to understand how animals can evolve, how one species can change into another. And like it or not, man is part of evolution, too. And we're just as unaware of it as the animals around us. What Darwin proposed is still, to this day, known as a theory. Well, we may never know about the origin of life. All we can do is look for the traces left behind by time. But I absolutely understand why man wants to ask these questions. I'm not so sure why we're always so preoccupied by knowing the answers, but that's just me. Funding for In the Wild is provided by annual financial support from viewers like you.